Good morning. My name is Saray Helms. I'm the Community Relations Specialist here for Greater Nevada Credit Union. Joining me, if you are my teammates, Chris Holland, Kirsten Fisher, and Valerie Hahn. Uh, thank you for joining us on this recorded presentation. We would like yourself we would like to have yourselves put yourselves on mute, please, but we will have a few question and answer sections during this. Greater Nevada is finding a growing need for financial education from our community members. Each month, we'll be showcasing a financial topic that we hope will help our community move forward towards financial wellness. If you're interested in learning more about these webinars, please just check out our website. It's at gncu.org um, and you can search for under resources and there's lots of financial education under there that we'll be talking about more later. Today's presentation is on debt management, which has been by far one of our most requested topics and I'm very excited for today. Uh, I would like to introduce you guys to today's presenter, Tom Wamba. Tom Wamba is the vice president of our member services here at Greater Nevada Credit Union. He's been in banking, helping Nevadans and their families in personal finance for nearly 30 years. Tom and his wife met while attending Sparks High School, so a local, and he has four uh, kids and two amazing grandkids. Having raised for a, a excuse me, having raised a family for almost 30 years, he's no stranger to budget that's for sure, and finance, and making the ends meet. Uh, so happy to have you here, Tom, to present today's topics on debt. I know you're very passionate, so I will hand it over to you. Welcome, Tom. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ray. I am thrilled to be here talking about this really important subject today. Um, welcome to all of those attending this webinar live and to those that will be record or listening to the recording. Uh, this is just such an important subject, and I hope that uh, folks can gain some guidance from what we'll talk about today and better the lives of themselves, their families, and others that they come into contact with. I'm going to go ahead and start uh, launching here our PowerPoint deck that will walk us through some important topics today. So it's going to take a second, it looks like. And here we go. As I get started, can everyone see our deck that says debt management? That slide? Looks good, Tom. We yes, can sir. keep going. OK, wonderful. Thank you. Well, gang, this is what we are here to talk about today, which is managing debt. Um, parts of uh, debt management will include doing things like um, reducing and eliminating debt, but also just managing it appropriately is a wonderful thing to be discussing. It can truly help you with your family finances and improve your lives. Um, as we walk through here, you're going to find uh, quite a few resources. And I'd love for you to pay attention to the QR codes that are on your screen right now. Um, Greater Nevada loves to assist folks with knowledge, with support, with community in, uh, information and involvement. And if you have the opportunity to do so, please take these, um, these uh, QR codes so that you can give some feedback to the team here about how they're doing and things that you'd love to see them tackle and cover in the future. Um, there's a lot of topics that Greater Nevada loves to share information about, and your feedback will help them to select those things that they want to do next. So if there's something that you're passionate about, uh, make sure you give them that feedback. All right, moving through here. This is what we're going to be covering in this workshop. We're going to be discussing debt. We're going to be discussing the most common types of debt and to learn how you can recognize for yourself debt that would be appropriate and debt that might not be appropriate for your family and for your household. We're going to describe the value of using debt management tools and strategies, things that can help you uh, achieve your plans in the realm of debt management. And then we're going to compare various strategies that will help you do those things. So we're going to get started, and I don't want to start off on a bummer, you guys. It's a Friday when we're recording this, which is a day that a lot of us are enjoying. So I'm sorry to crash you with some bummer stats right off the beginning. But let's talk a little bit about the reality of debt and just how much debt impacts us. Now, simply stated, debt is just owing someone money. It could be money that you owe someone for a home mortgage that you've taken out. It could be money that you owe on a credit card, a car loan, student loans. It could be for medical bills uh, or loans for medical services. It could be furniture that you bought a while ago and you're paying for it over time. Just about anything. Uh, anything that you've borrowed from somebody else is going to be debt. And Americans have a lot of debt. 
The average American household, as you can see from our slide, has over $100,000 that they owe somebody for something. Now, that would include mortgages, um, but that in, that's just the debt that almost every American household has. 77% of all Americans are in debt in some form or fashion. That means three out of four of us that are attending this call, maybe more of us, uh, and three out of four of the folks that you see walking down the street have some form of debt. Uh, on average, Americans spend almost 10% of their monthly income to satisfy debt payments. That excludes mortgages. Now, what does that mean? 9.7%, that sounds a lot. That sounds like it could be bad. Here's a context I'd love to offer you. If you think about it, how would your personal finances change if you got a 10% raise tomorrow? Uh, if your boss called you up and said, hey, I would love for you to have 10% more money in your paycheck, that's the kind of money that could probably positively impact your finances and maybe give you greater options in life. Um, that's the impact the debt probably has on your personal financial management today. Uh, almost 10% of what most Americans spend is dedicated to just servicing debt that they have. So uh, think about the possibilities of eliminating that debt. And I'm sorry to admit it, but that excludes mortgage debt. So that's almost 10% that uh, would include those kinds of other debts that we just discussed. Um, it's very impact impactful to your budget. Um, so um, we don't need to stand, spend a lot of time about the reality of debt and uh, the bummer slide here. We're gonna move forward and talk through what we can do about that situation. But uh, we just want everybody who's attending this webinar live and those that are uh, listening to it recorded to realize that if you find yourself among those 77% of Americans that have debt, if you find yourself among those mem uh, Americans that spend almost 10% of your monthly income to service debt, you're not alone. Um, most of us are in that boat. And so uh, we want to find out what we can do about that, ways that we can move forward. So let's start talking about different types of debt, how debt works. Um, is debt good? Is debt bad? Uh, you might have heard some of these terms about how we categorize debt. Let's talk through those things. So uh, the first category that we're going to talk about is secured versus unsecured debt. Now, a secured debt is one in which there's collateral for a loan. Uh, the idea of a secure debt is generally that a lender has a stake in whatever you bought and that they could take possession of it if you fail to pay. Uh, secure debt, think of things like house loans or car loans. An unsecured debt is the opposite of that. It's a debt that's based solely on your credit worthiness. These are loans like a credit card or a payday loan. Now, generally speaking, the interest rates and the terms of unsecured debt are going to be less favorable, favorable for the borrower than they will be for secured debt. It kind of makes sense, doesn't it? If you've got a house that a lender could foreclose on if you fail to pay it, they've got something of value that they can hopefully get their money out of. If it's just your good word, um, that's something that they have uh, less uh, stake in and a higher risk, and so they're going to charge you more for that. So that's secured versus unsecured debt. Now, there's also another term that you've probably talked, to, uh, probably heard about, revolving versus installment debt. Uh, this is a different kind of categorization. Uh, installment debt is where you borrow a sum of money once, and then you're going to pay it back over time. Revolving debt is different, and that's the type of debt where as you pay it down, it becomes available again. So think of a re um, an installment debt, something like a car loan again where you borrow X number of dollars, and then as you keep making your payments, that uh, amount that you owe gets lower. And then that's different from something like a credit card, which is a revolving debt, where you might have a credit line, you could use some of it. And then as you make your payments, that amount becomes a borrow borrowable again. So you've got revolving debt, one time, or I'm sorry, uh, multiple access points to the loan. And then you've got installment debt, where you borrow it once and you just pay it down over time. So. Um, how about another way that people like to categorize loans? Uh, good debt, bad debt. Uh, I'm not a, a huge Clint Eastwood fan, but I love the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so uh, that's uh, the thing that came to my mind when we started talking about good debt versus bad debt. And uh, I don't mind saying that there's probably some ugly debt out there as well. Um, you'd probably hear from a lot of different financial advisor type folks different concepts about what constitutes a good debt and what constitutes a bad debt. I'd like to describe to you my philosophy on that. 
I don't think that good debt or bad debt can fall easily into lines with something like a house loan is a good debt, um, a credit card is a bad debt. Uh, a house loan uh, might not be a good debt for you if it's not appropriate for your personal budget. And so what I like to talk about is the appropriateness of debt. Uh, good versus bad has a lot less to do with type of a loan it is than it does with the appropriateness for your particular situation of that particular debt. Not all home, let, home loan debt is good debt. Uh, buying too much house could have a terrible impact on fi family finance. Not all credit card is bad. Um, credit cards exist for legitimate borrowing purposes too. Um, student debt, uh, student loans is something that comes up. It's been in the news a lot lately. Um, I'll tell you, student loans can be a wonderful tool to help somebody advance in their life and advance their finances as well. But I shudder when I hear somebody say that they're taking out $100,000 for a student loan with absolutely no idea how they're going to pay it back because they're earning a degree in underwater basket weaving or something like that. Um, I, do, I wouldn't disparage anybody's education, um, but the concept that I could borrow an immense sum of money and put that towards a degree that has no possibility of paying me back through my career would indicate to me that that might be inappropriate debt if you don't have other ways to finance your education. And uh, the complete reverse of that, so there are some educational expenses that are absolutely worth it and can set somebody up for financial success throughout their life. So um, I don't think, uh, at least according to Tom's philosophy, that it's really easy to categorize debt as good or bad. I really think about it appropriate, um, as appropriate or not. And that situation is different for every person. And so you really have to think about your own personal finances to determine if the debt is an appropriate debt for you or if it's not an appropriate debt for you. So what might be some of the signs that you're living in a world in which some of the debt that you've taken on is not appropriate for you? Let's talk a little bit about something called debt distress. Debt distress is simply uh, put um, something that uh, might be stressing you out about your debt. Um, let's take a look at a few of these. And if you find yourself with any of these kinds of things in your life, um, or uh, if you know somebody who has these kinds of things in your life, you might find that you have some debt distress and it might be worth taking a strong look at your finances to see if there's a way that you can eliminate or reduce some of those items. So um, what are some of these things? How about using payday loans? Uh, payday loans are generally speaking, um, a kind of a loan that's taken out at very advantageous terms and rates for the lender, not for the borrower. High, high rates. And they're usually for us when we're pretty desperate. Um, that might be a sign that managing finances is a struggle for you and you might be under debt distress if you're using payday loans. Um, how about just paying the minimum amount on credit cards, not being able to pay the balance down very aggressively and only being able to pay whatever the minimum is? Um, oh, this one's a big one for me. It's about five down on this slide. How about using credit cards to pay for living expenses? Um, this one is tough. If you find yourself needing to pay for bills off of credit cards and not just pay for something that you know you can pay back right away, that might be a sign that you're under debt distress. Using one credit card to pay off another one, that's a tough one. Um, how about savings to pay bills? Now that's one that we might not think about because oftentimes we think I'm a smart money manager. I put my money into savings, that's great. Um, but maybe if you're tapping into that savings more frequently than you want to, or you're not able to use your savings for whatever the purpose was that you were saving for, that might also be a sign of debt distress. Um, gang, this isn't an entire list uh, that would include all the things that might be an indicator of debt distress. It's not um, got everything on there. Uh, and you wouldn't have to say, well, I have none of these, so I have no debt distress. That might not be accurate. There's other signs. Um, and uh, you might have one or more of these signs that it might not be stressful to you. So this isn't a, a, a completely inclusionary list, but it's worth some, uh, it's worth thinking about. If you find yourself in any of these situations, it's just worth some introspection and identify, am I stressed out by my debt? And uh, do I want to try to do something about that? So before we move on to what do we do if we're in debt to stress and how we can manage that, I'd like to pause. I think it's a good time to just see if we have any questions about what we've discussed so far, which is really just learning a little bit more about debt. In our next section, we're going to actually talk about some things that you can do about debt. 
Uh, but before we move on, uh, do we have any questions? And uh, Saray, I know that you and Chris are monitoring chat. Do we have any questions from chat or do we have anybody that wants to jump off of mute and ask a live question? Hello, Tom, and hello, everyone. Um, just as a reminder, we will have a few of these question breaks throughout this webinar, um, but we do have myself, Chris Holland, Valerie Hahn, um, and Kirsten Fisher in that chat as well to help kind of navigate those questions until those question breaks come. Um, so we do welcome you at these moments to either we can pause Tom and ask those questions, you can come off of mute and ask those questions. Um, not at this time, Tom, but I did want to pause for a moment. And just on that last slide, yeah. seeing how many people are in distress of right feeling this debt, um, they talked about, you know, most Americans are feeling this. So I wanted to pause and ask you, you know, I think I'll, I'll hear from a lot of people that quote of, well, if I get approved, doesn't it mean I can afford oh. it? Wow, you know, that's a fantastic question. Um, this is going to sound like a really kind of an odd concept coming from a guy that works for a financial institution that loans people money. So I hope you don't think I'm disingenuous when I state this particular uh, concept. When a lender approves you for a loan, that generally indicates they think you're a good risk. Uh, now, hopefully, if it's somebody that does things like what my employer, Greater Nevada, attempts to do, that means that they're partnering with you to help identify whether this is uh, good for you or not uh, before simply approving. But when you get approved for something, Saray, it often simply means somebody thinks that you might be able to pay that back or they have a strong concept that, they, that you might pay it back. What they aren't considering and what you should consider is what kind of stress that may or may not place upon your finances. Just because you get approved doesn't necessarily mean that you should. Um, here's a great example. We all probably grew up with somebody that we knew um, maybe they grew up in a family where uh, family finance wasn't openly discussed and they didn't learn a lot at a very young age. I'm in that club. Uh, in my family, my folks, uh, it's just not something that they were very skilled at. And so I didn't have any education like that at home. We all probably had some friend that got their very first credit card and then went out and bought something totally stupid and ridiculous. So they had absolutely no way to afford. Think. Um, who in here had uh, somebody that they might have gone to school with or somebody just out of school that had really nice furniture? That's one that I kind of think about, Saray. Um, the furniture store approved them for that $1,500, $2,000, $3,000 couch, whatever it was. And you think, you know, you're eating um, uh, chips and uh, top ramen to be able to survive. Do you really need a $2,000 couch? Um, the financer probably looked at the what somebody could afford and said, yeah, if you don't borrow any other mon uh, money, I'll loan you money for this couch. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that was a good thing for you to do. You probably had wiser things like maybe eating a little protein uh, now and again. Uh, we can't survive on top ramen forever. So um, just because somebody approves you doesn't necessarily mean that it's a great bet. I see a lot of people that have bought too much home um, because uh, they could get approved for it and uh, they wanted something. But it meant that uh, they had a tough time paying for reliable vehicles uh, after that. Or, you know, maybe they couldn't get all the kids school supplies that they would have liked to have. So budgets are all about choices. And um, whenever we choose money to spend something on one thing, it means we're choosing not to spend it on another. And just getting approved for something doesn't necessarily mean that you can really afford it and do the other things financially that you'd like to do. So I, uh, I appreciate that question. It's a really good one. And it's a common one, Saray. Um, I thank you so much for answering that. I think that's perfect. It, I think it comes back to the old saying of like, just because you have that much to spend doesn't mean we should spend it, yeah. right? Like you said, if you really want to balance in that life, um, try not to push all of it. We did have a couple uh comments come through chat that maybe we will get to these later on. I know we've only gotten to a couple slides, but thank you guys for asking these questions. Again, this is one of our most requested topics. So one of the benefits of being here live is you do get to ask those questions and have them answered from Greater Nevada staff right here. Um, so one of the questions is, well, what's a good percentage uh, to allocate 
or to consider putting towards savings when paying off or trying to get out of debt? All right, that's an excellent question. We are going to discuss topics just like that, and we can make sure we address this one specifically when we talk about building a budget. Um, that's an awesome question, and it really is a budget-based uh, consideration depending on what your specific goals are. So we can chat about that one. I also see, Saray, we've got another uh, question in chat that has to do with credit card companies and balance transfers. Yeah. Great topic. We're going to talk about that as well. So um, if, uh, if we don't have any other questions specifically talking about what kinds of debt there are or types of debt, let's move forward and we're going to be able to address some of these chat questions and others as we go. You got so. it. Let's go ahead and move on and we will not forget about you, but I think that just let us know if they're not answered later on in the yep. presentation. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Tom. We're going to have uh, absolutely, Sir. Thanks. We're going to have at least one more and I think two more opportunities to answer questions. So uh, I think we're going to address these ones. And if we don't bring them back up, uh, just say, Tom, you knucklehead, you forgot to address that and we'll get to it. So promise. All right. So we're going to talk about managing debt now, and we're specifically going to go over three steps on how to manage debt. The first one is creating a budget. The second one, and uh, this one is kind of interesting, we're going to talk about increasing your income. And then the third one, we're going to talk about how to reduce your debt as part of managing debt. So let's jump right into those concepts right there. So creating a budget. Why do you want to do it? Why is it important? Well, let's talk about some of the things you need to do if you're going to create a smart budget, and then we're going to discuss why creating a budget is so important. So one of the first things you need to do if you're going to um, create a smart budget is you got to track your spending. This is, I think, the first thing that I think people stumble on when they try to address their finances that they really need to address strongly if they're going to get a handle on things. If you aren't tracking your spending, you just don't know where and how much you're spending money on what. And you need to do that if you're going to be able to build a budget around those things that you need to do. Um, how do you do that? It's easier for Tom to say, track your spending, and then somebody might say, I just don't even know how that works. There's a couple of simple ways. Um, one of them might be to just look at your bank statements um, over the last month or last couple of months. This should give you a pretty good idea of where your money goes. Unless you're somebody that carries around a lot of cash, and there's not many of those folks these days. Most of us use uh, pieces of plastic, debit cards, credit cards, those kinds of things to pay for things, even uh, mobile applications like Apple Pay and those sorts of deals. Um, but just look over your statements for those products and services. They're going to tell you where you spent your money and how much you spent your money on. Uh, you might also consider using an app uh, to do that. I did that, um, I'd say it was about two and a half years ago. My wife and I took a debt management uh, course. And at that time, you guys, I've been a banker for 25 plus years, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and as much as I have helped people and tried to assist folks with managing their own finances, there were just some stuff I wanted to get a handle on. And I will admit that tracking my spending is something I had never done. I'd found a, an easy app. I think it cost a dollar or something. It was called Expenses OK. Uh, this is not an endorsement for them. I'm sure there's other ones out there. Um, but I loved the app that I used because it allowed you with just a couple of clicks to track your spending. So you just put in how much you had spent on something. It had a whole bunch of categories. And so with one button uh, click, you could uh, tell that app where you had spent that money. And then at the end of the month, it categorized it for you. So um, there's a lot of different ways to do so. Sorry, gang. All right. Um, there's a lot of different ways to uh, track those expenses, whether you like to do it on paper with a pen or pencil, or you like to use an app, uh, doesn't matter. But any way that you do it, it's just critical for you to do so for you to build a good budget. You just have to know where the money goes before you can begin managing it. Okay, the second bullet point is far easier to say than it is to actually do, and it's live within your means. I've kind of alluded to that a little earlier with some of those expenses that uh, folks have gone into debt for that isn't necessarily wise, uh, buying too much house, maybe buying too much car. I've seen plenty of friends of mine uh, do that. Uh, that's something that just, I I'm sorry, if I don't have a Lamborghini income, I probably shouldn't have a Lamborghini ride. Um, and that can be tough because a lot of us think that, uh, you know, we've struggled in life or we've saved and so we, we deserve a something. Um, but the honest truth is if, if your income doesn't support that something, then um, 
whether you um, you know have friends that do it or not, uh, it's just not a great idea to overbuy. Uh, living within your means, it can be really hard to realize that you may not be able to afford everything that you want to spend money on. Keeping up with the Joneses, it's a real thing. It's a phrase for a reason. Um, but do your best to focus on the benefits of reducing debt and set living within your means as a top budget priority. It's really important. Um, build a plan. Uh, that sounds like it's a, it should be a no-brainer, but it's important to actually sit down and do it. Focus on the things that are the most important priorities. And one of the best exercises you can ever do in building out your plan is prioritizing needs over wants. That can be as simple as after you've tracked your spending and you've determined what you spend money on, just write, sit down with a pen and paper uh, and draw out two columns. That's it. Uh, and it just one column says needs and one column says wants. And then just take all the money that you have spent and put it in one of those things. Need uh, shelter, you know, uh, my rent payment, my mortgage payment. That's probably a need. Um, want my Starbucks run. You know, if I've got a daily Starbucks habit and that's five bucks or oh, who's kidding who, right? Eight bucks probably these days. Um, if you're spending eight bucks a day on coffee, is that a need or a want? I know I'm going to hear from people. They're going to blow me up and say, Tom, I need my caffeine fix in the morning. I'm an advocate for saying now that's pretty firmly in the want uh, column. And it might be surprising as you figure out how much of your monthly um, output is in the want column. But you want to be able to build a plan that prioritizes the needs first, the needs over the wants. Uh, and then as you start to build that budget, uh, here's a couple of things that you want to take a look at that help you build a stronger budget. The first is to set realistic, motivating financial goals. So in my budget, I want to, and and uh, Chris asked a question in the chat. I'm going to get uh, kind of to your question right now, Chris. Um, you said, how much should I put into savings versus how much should I focus on debt reduction? Um, there's not a specific number that's a perfect number for everybody. It really depends upon your goals. So when you are determining what you want your budget to be, set motivating goals for you. Um, if debt is under control and you don't really need to attend this webinar and you're attending this for others, then you might set savings for a specific uh, topic as a primary goal for yourself. Maybe there's some vacation that you've always wanted to take. Maybe there's some um, car upgrade that you're really trying to afford and you want to pay for it with cash, which is a great and smart financial move. Um, then putting more money into savings is a motivating goal for you because you're passionate about improving your ride or going to Disneyland, which will cost you a billion dollars roughly today. Um, but if debt reduction is something that is hurting and some of those debt stressors that we saw is something that you really want to get a handle on, then it could be extremely motivating to pay off that credit card that you've been using for the last 10 years. It might be extremely motivating to uh, pay off the kids' braces loan that you took out. It kind of depends on what are the things that are motivating to you. Um, we're going to talk more about this as we go through, but debt management can be a really emotional topic. And so uh, emotions don't always have to be negative when dealing with budgeting. Uh, it can actually be a very powerful tool for us. So when you are looking to set priorities in your budget, set realistic goals, but set motivating financial goals. Um, and don't gloss over that realistic word. Um, I've got $50,000 in credit card debt, and I'm going to pay it off within six months. Are you going to make an extra $50,000 within the next six months to be able to pay all that off? If the answer is no, that may not be a real realistic goal for you. If you chart things out and it's going to take you four years to pay off some particular debt that you want to pay off, that's okay. It's completely okay. If that motivates you, that's a great goal to have. Um, but let's be real about it. If you can do it over four years, then set a four-year target for it. Okay, uh, next bullet. Find and use a budgeting system. There's a lot of them out there. Quicken is among the most popular. Um, there's a lot of apps out there. Um, I talked about a tracking program that I use uh, called Expenses OK. I think it might also have a budgeting element. Um, uh, that might be a real easy one to use. Find something that you like. Um, uh, you guys, there's other methods out there. There's something called the envelope method that you might have come across. Um, this is one that I'll tell you, frankly, didn't work for my wife and I. When we were young, we were trying to get a handle on our budget. Um, essentially, the envelope method works just like this. You cash your paycheck on payday, you take all the cash home, um, and you have all these envelopes that are there for different purposes. One says food, one says uh, gas or fuel, uh, one says rent. Um, 
and you put the appropriate amount of money that you've budgeted in each of these envelopes, and then um, you pull the money out when you need to use it. Uh, and uh, so if you've got an entertainment budget and you put uh, 50 bucks a month in there, by the time your 50 bucks is out, then there's no more entertainment for the month. That's the concept of the envelope method. Um, you have to be disciplined to use it. And what we found uh, with my wife and I is we would steal from <laughs> one of the envelopes uh, when we wanted to go out to eat. So uh, that's one that you kind of have to uh, be pretty disciplined in using, but it's very, very effective for some. So uh, it doesn't really matter what budgeting system you use, as long as it's one that works for you. Uh, John, I see your comment there. That would be me. Yeah, I'm at that phone. Um, uh, Saray, uh, I can see that you got your hand up. Did you have a comment for us? Yes, Tom. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but uh, when you just said find a system that works for you, uh, it clicked with me. I was really kind of surprised to hear that the envelope system didn't work for you and your wife <laughs> because I'm a huge advocate of the envelope system. I feel as though I need to separate my funds. Otherwise, yeah. I will dip into them. But I will agree with you, ca the cash idea no longer works with me. But what I've kind of done is so to say, an electronic uh, envelope system. You know, I have multiple checking accounts. I have two checking accounts, one for my bills and one for my spending. And I actually, I'll admit this, I have five savings accounts, um, but each one is an envelope for a different goal. So if my car has problems, I can take out of that envelope and my Disneyland fund is still okay. So I just wanna say <laughs> maybe the envelope system didn't work for you, but I still am an advocate of the electronic envelope system. <laughs> you know, Saray, I'm so glad you bring that, that comment up because I'll admit that when we were younger, my wife and I weren't disciplined with the envelope method, but we do the same thing that you just described. I never thought about um, the separate savings accounts that I have personally as the envelope method, but it so is. Um, when you identify a budget priority for yourself and you put together a savings account just for that, uh, for instance, we've got a car fund. Um, we know that at some point in time, we're gonna have to put new uh, tires on the car or we've got to register it every year. And I didn't like, kind of having some money to sit in the regular household checking account for that throughout the year. So I put that into a separate bucket. So I like it, sorry, that's a great call out. Um, so envelope uh, method is alive and well today. <laughs> um, and then the last bullet we've got there is be accountable to your budget and review it regularly. Um, whatever budget uh, methodology you use, be accountable to it. Uh, that was why the envelope method didn't work for my wife and I when we were younger, because we weren't accountable to it. We um, tried it because somebody advised us to do it and it didn't very much work for us. And so uh, it lasted, that exercise lasted maybe two months, maybe three uh, before we realized, eh, it's not worth it. And then we just didn't do anything. Um, if you've determined that uh, Starbucks run is really important to you and you say, but I can only budget for once a week for it, be accountable to it. If you find yourself slipping into twice uh, last week, then maybe you go without this week and try to stick back to your budget. So being accountable to your budget and reviewing it regularly is important. So let's talk about the next factor of um, managing debt wisely, and this is increase your income. Now, I fully admit having this slide is a little bit of a risk reward thing because if this one was so easy, we'd all just do that, right? Huh? Tom just said, all I need to do to tackle my finances is just make more money. Great, what a smart guy he is. Um, but there may be some ways that we can increase income that we haven't necessarily thought of. And it's really important to remember that creating a budget and trimming expenses is critical to managing your finances wisely but sometimes it might not be enough to be able to achieve what you want to achieve, whether that's reducing debt or some other financial objective. So try to consider adding to the other side of the equation as well. Trimming is good, gotta do it, but adding income to the other side of the balance sheet um, might be a strong way to accomplish what you're trying to do, uh, specifically a specific goal. So let's talk about some of the ways you can do it. You might have an employer where overtime work is allowable. Maybe it's not particularly enjoyable. That's why you haven't done it before, but they have the opportunity and they offer it. So that might be something that you you ask to do is pick up some extra shifts and um, add to the income side of your ledger. Um, how about getting a second job? 
some employers would look at that and say, yeah, I don't have a problem with it. Now, some of you might have um, employment situations where that's uh, frowned upon, and I'm not going to ask anybody to get in hot water with their employer. Um, but side hustles are a huge thing, and they're out there. I have a couple of friends um, who have uh, done Uber or Lyft for a period of time uh, to try to accomplish one specific financial goal that they had. Uh, and at least one of those was getting out of, from under a particular debt. Only did it for three or four months, uh, accomplished the goal that they had, and then hung it up. Uh, decided that uh, Uber wasn't something they wanted to do long term, but it was able to really hit one particular financial need. Um, I'll tell you, uh, I have adult children, and uh, three of my four adult children have done this at some point in time because the the one job just wasn't enough uh, to accomplish what they wanted to financially. And so the side hustle was something they needed to do. Um, DoorDash, really popular one these days. Um, and then here's one that we might not all think about, which is selling something. Uh, some of us have things that clutter around the house that um, have some kind of value to them. Uh, I'm not a huge Marie Kondo uh, person. I know a lot of folks have done that. I never got into it um, where you look to see if everything in your life has joy. But I know that there's stuff, you guys, in my house, maybe hanging out in my garage, maybe hanging in my closet that I spent money on that has some kind of value to somebody else. and I just don't use it anymore. So um, as much as uh, that one sounds like a weird thing, oh, I'm selling you know, my shoes or this nice dress that I bought or this tool that I don't use anymore. Um, that can be a way to generate some cash and increase your income um, temporarily. So um, uh, anyway, just a couple of concepts here to uh, I just want everybody to remember that uh, there's two sides of the ledger when you're talking about um, your finances. And we shouldn't focus exclusively on one side because the truth is you can cut some things. All of us probably have things that we can cut and prioritize in our budgets, but you can't cut your way to financial independence um all the way um sometimes you got to find a way to increase on the other side of the ledger so um let's talk about the one that most of us are probably the most keenly interested in by attending this webinar and that's reducing debt as part of managing debt there's several different ways to do it we've got five steps that we think that are smart that you can take to start reducing your debt so let's go through those the first one might sound obvious but it's stop creating debt um, if you find yourself through that tracking your expenses exercise that we talked about, that your credit card um, balance is getting higher every month, not lower, you want to stop creating that debt. Find ways to put those credit cards away and stop using them. Uh, revolving debt should be used for emergencies, not as a source of income. That's a way to think about that. If I'm using my credit card to buy food on a monthly basis, I need to find a way to sharpen up my budget and sharpen up my tools to be able to handle that more appropriately. Think of revolving debt as something to do in emergencies, but not as a standard way to manage my finances. Um, analyzing debt. We talked about tracking expenses, and that's a part of analyzing debt. Um, but analyze what you've borrowed for. Why did we borrow it? What did we buy with it? And was that a need or a want? You're going to need to look at that before you can start reducing your debt. Um, how about refinancing or consolidating debt? There was a question earlier in the comments about balance transfers and uh, if those are okay. I keep getting offers in the mail. Should I pick? Uh, should I take one of those up and combine a credit card into another one? Um, that might be a good uh, deal. Um, it's a little difficult to figure out what everybody's situation, uh, what tactic is best in everybody's situation. Sometimes rolling that Balance into another credit card is a good idea. Sometimes it might not be, but refinancing and consolidating debt can be a strong tool in reducing your debt. You've got four different uh, credit cards that are all at 20%. You've got a balance, combined balances of $10,000 between all of them or more. Um, you might find that consolidating all of those into a fixed rate loan where you're paying it down over time at 10% or 12 or 15 or something saves you some money in the long run. And so that might be a, a really smart move. So uh, it's not wise in every situation, particularly if you don't cancel those cards or or, or um, stop using them. Sorry, don't cancel them, but uh, stop using them um, after you consolidate them. But uh, it can be a really strong tool in your tool chest. How about number four? Uh, set goals to repay that debt. Uh, this again might sound like an easy uh, or a simple one. 
but it's interesting how many of us get this far in our budgeting process, but we don't actually set this as a goal is to reduce that debt. We might set a goal to make our payments, which is good, but making our payments generally doesn't reduce our debt very quickly. And so setting goals to repay your debt and to reduce that debt. Now, it's really important to be realistic about this. Establish a timeline that's based on your budget for how long it's going to take you to pay down your debt. Uh, if it's not realistic, it's not really a goal. So it's just kind of a hope. And hope isn't a really good strategy when it comes to reducing debt. So do the math. If you need to ask someone to help you with the math, there's a lot of folks out there. And we're going to talk about some great resources, great Nevada offers for free to allow you to talk to experts that will help you out with that. But um, set realistic goals. And then number five, again, sounds simple. Implement your plan. The best plan in the world, if you don't actually do it, um, doesn't do you any good. It's like having that uh, Lamborghini again and you just parking in the garage the whole time. You might have it, but it's not doing you anything. Um, so if you haven't implemented your plan, start it. Um, if you haven't implemented the hardest part of your plan, start it. Um, if you're getting a little bit scared of it because you have built a, a, a challenging budget to yourself, just start it. Uh, if you find that you're not able to do it, okay, recalibrate later, but don't be so afraid of your plan that you don't implement it. And this is like one of those things, like all of us, when's, when are we going to the gym? All of you on this call, if you're like me, is uh, next week. <laughs> uh, when am I going to go on that diet? Uh, next month, uh, just after the holidays. Um, we've all got reasons why we're willing to um, delay something that's going to be a little tough. Your, your debt reduction plan is one of those things a lot of us fail to do right away. So um, implement your plan as a key factor in um, paying down that debt. So let's talk about some different ways to reduce that debt. And we're going to talk about these debt reduction strategies. So um, the first thing you'll see on the top of this slide, and for those of you that are listening to this and maybe not watching closely, uh, I'm going to uh, verbalize this one just so you hear it, because this is a really, really critical factor if you want to reduce your debt. You're going to need to pay more of the principal of your loan um, if you're going to reduce your debt quickly. And that just means making extra payments. It could be making an, a full extra payment or a partial extra payment, doesn't matter. If your minimum payment on your credit card is $27.30 this month, paying 30 bucks is exercising this principle, paying more on principle. Um, so that's the thing that we're gonna talk about and how you're gonna do that to the best effect. There's two methods we wanna describe to you guys today. One is called the avalanche and one is called the snowball method. Now the avalanche method, says that you should list all of your debts from the highest to lowest interest rate. And then after you've made sure that all of your monthly payment obligations are met, the additional principal that you have to pay towards those debts, you're going to focus on the highest interest rate. Now, this methodology makes the most sense financially. What it means is that the debt that costs you the most is the one that you're going to pay the fir uh, first out uh, of the order of all of those things. It's smart, it pays, um, it makes the most sense from a financial aspect, and it's a great way to um, try to reduce the amount of interest that you pay on a monthly basis. So the avalanche method says, pay all of your debts in order from highest rate to lowest rate after paying your minimum payments. The second method is the snowball method. This one is a little different. It says that you should list all of your debts from the smallest balance to the largest balance and that any extra principal that you have that you can pay towards your debt goes towards the smallest debt, not the smallest interest rate, the smallest dollar figure in the debt. Now, the reason why you do this one is more of an emotional answer than it is the math answer. There can be a huge emotional uplift and motivation that comes from paying off that credit card. So um, you take a look at that smallest balance. You got a $5,000 bill. You got a $400 bill. You got a $10,000 bill. This one, the, the snowball says, take, take a crack at that $400 bill first. Pay that sucker off because once you pay that off and now you're only dealing with two debts instead of three debts or seven debts instead of nine debts. Um, you find that uh, emotionally you just feel empowered because your plan is working. So um, you just kind of have to know what your motivations are. If you need the motivation of seeing a bill say zero, Snowball is probably right for you. If you're a math person uh, and you say, no, why would I pay off a 10% debt when I've got a 15% debt out there? And you can see the satisfaction paying off the highest rate debt uh, first, then the avalanche method is probably right for you. Neither of these is right, neither of these is wrong. 
It just kind of depends on what it is that you need to keep you going with your plan. So two great ways to reduce debt. Let's continue taking a look at some of the things that you um, uh, want to do with managing debt, some do's and some don'ts. Uh, we're going to start a little backwards here. We're going to talk about don'ts first. Um, this one might sound odd to you. Don't close out your credit card accounts. Um, after you've paid them off, keep them. Um, you want to try to not use them. If you don't trust yourself, and most of us shouldn't actually trust ourselves, um, consider a couple of weird things that might help you to not use those credit cards. Um, I've heard of people freezing a credit card in a block of ice and then sticking it in your freezer. And uh, what that means to them is they've got to wait for the ice to thaw before they could use the credit card. Uh, so there's kind of a delayed, let me think about it for a minute before I use that. That might work. Maybe just cutting up the card itself is a way to help you from not physically using it. Um, this one might uh, be a little old fashioned because so many of us have these cards um, that we would use uh, online or maybe in an Apple wallet or something like that. So we don't actually need the physical card anymore. Uh, but the reason why you don't want to close out those cards necessarily is that could um, harm your credit score. Um, when you keep the card open, uh, that can be beneficial to your credit score. And you still want to, even while you're trying to actively uh, pay down debt, maintain uh, uh, as high a credit score as you can, because that will actually make your debt uh, usually less expensive. If your, um, uh, if your credit score goes down while you're paying down your debt, it's possible that that could be a reason why uh, a financer like your credit card company might want to increase the rate you have on that card. So you generally want to keep an eye on your credit score while you do this. Paying on debt will actually increase your score, which is great. Um, but this is the reason why you might not want to close out that card. Um, here's another absolute don't. This is what I'm passionate about. Don't borrow from your retirement plan. Um, this, uh, your retirement plan is going to do far more good for you financially in the long run where it is earning interest and um, working towards your retirement goals than it will be at paying down your debt. I see people do this one a lot, and it just makes me so sad when I see it. Um, we might, maybe there's another reason to do another webinar on uh, the Rule 72 and um, preparing for retirement, but it's incredible how much that long-term uh, benefit to you in retirement is if you keep your money in there and you've got it invested well. Um, so don't rob from your future self to uh, pay off the, the the Starbucks run you did last week. Okay, don't trust all debt settlement companies. Um, that doesn't mean all of them are crooks because that's absolutely not the case, but just do your research first. Um, there are some of them out there that are really there to help you and do strong negotiation on um, uh, your behalf. And then there's others that um, really don't do you much good at all. And so you want to make sure that you do your research before uh, looking at a debt settlement organization to see if they're good. Um, any online um, survey kind of a tool where you're looking at how many stars they've got would be an, an easy research methodology. Um, and then the last one, don't hide from creditors. Um, this one can be hard and it can be something that um, people do. I don't have the money to pay the bill, and so I don't want to answer that telephone call. That's a pretty natural and human response, but you want to avoid it if you can. Um, hiding from the creditors doesn't do you much good, and oftentimes, look, creditors want you to pay back the debt. Sometimes they can be threatening in the means with which they try to get you to pay back the debt, but overall, they want you to do that. And so it behooves both of you to enter into a conversation and just talk through what your finances are like. Um, I have seen some really great things happen for folks when they negotiate with creditors. And we're going to talk about that in just a second as far as some of the dues that you uh, are interested in. But hiding from them is one you don't want to do. So let's start at the top of that list of things you do want to do. Um, may I interrupt before Please we go do. to the slide? Yes. Um, I wanted to welcome Donna before we go too far and before we lose this question. Um, Donna had a question. So oh, yeah. Donna, if you would like to, you are absolutely welcome to come off of mute and ask that Tom um, that question before we move any forward, or we can assist you in chat. Thank you again for your participation. I'll give a second to see if Donna wants to ask it live. If not, we can move on. Okay. Um, well, let's go ahead and uh, move on. Or I'm sorry, Saray. Uh, did you want us to address that one through the chat? 
absolutely. I will assist her through chat. And then Donna, if your answer is, or excuse me, if your question is still not answered after these slides, we do have a question break right around um, the corner and we can assist you then. Thank you. Mark. All right. Thanks, Saray. Great moderating. Excellent. So um, what do you do with creditors? Negotiate with them. A telephone call can't hurt, and sometimes negotiating can reduce an interest rate. I've even seen folks take a uh, less amount in principle uh, through negotiating. Um, your creditors want their money back, and so negotiating with them is a strong concept in trying to get some relief. Uh, it doesn't work every time, so don't expect it to solve all the problems, but it is a great uh, tactic to use. Um, if you're struggling to pay off those things, sometimes just answering and talking to a human, uh, answering the phone and talking to a human can be a great way to uh, make some of those reliefs happen. Uh, do get credit counseling. Uh, credit counseling is a great thing to do. There are experts out there, and Saray is going to tell us about those at the end of this call that Greater Nevada has available for folks free of charge, um, where you can talk to somebody who can look at your personal financial situation and help you build out some plans that might be right for you. Your plan might not be perfect for everybody and everybody else's plan might not be perfect for you. It probably isn't. So speaking with a credit counselor that can work on your specific situation is a great, uh, great move. We talked about this a little bit uh, earlier, but do consider consolidating your debts. Sometimes the emotional concept of just having one bill to pay instead of those four cards is a great move. And other times it can just save you a lot of money. So it's not the uh, it's not perfect in every situation, but consider it. Take a look at it, do the math and see if it makes sense for you to try to consolidate your debt into single payments. It can make a, a lot of budgeting much smoother. And then here's one that sounds kind of um, uh, uh, kind of a wild idea here. But uh, if the situation is quite dire, consider hiring a debt settlement attorney. Um, this is something somebody who would advocate on your behalf with your creditors, negotiating settlements for lower amounts than what you owe them for or for favorable repayment terms. Again, this one, I would say this is kind of a dire situation. If uh, your budget uh, and managing your debt on your own looks like it has a chance of being successful, I would try that first because a debt settlement attorney is somebody who's going to be charging fees for their assistance. But this is absolutely something that you should consider if the situation is so dire, you're just underwater and you don't know what to do. There are folks who professionally will negotiate on your behalf with creditors uh, and potentially be able to either lower your bills, lower your rates, or get you more favorable terms so that you can afford those payments. So it's certainly something that you should put in there. I would place it as kind of a, uh, a uh, in extreme circumstances kind of a, a move, but it's absolutely something that belongs as part of um, part of your tool chest. So um, this is that time when uh, we were going to talk about this. And actually, the do's and the don'ts wrap up our uh, informative portion of this session. So um, Saray, maybe you want to uh, ping that chat and see what kind of questions we've had from some folks. And uh, folks, if you have more questions, go ahead and throw them in there and we'll see what we can address here with the time we've got before Saray shows us some of those tools I mentioned that Greater Nevada has available free of charge to help you with um, credit counseling and other sources of information. So, uh, Saray, what questions popped up in the chat that we'd like to address? Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tom. Again, I learned so much from this webinar, but before I get into some of um, the questions that came through, I do want to make sure that we addressed those ones prior um, and just give me a thumbs up. I have Chris and Valerie of what was a good percentage to allocate or consider putting towards debt? Uh -huh. That's great. Um, there's several different strategies that if you just kind of Google that you'll find them. Um, one is uh, called 50-30-20, and that one says that 50% of your um, income uh, or the money that you've got to be able to spend on these kinds of things should go towards your needs. 30% um, should go towards your um, wants, 20% towards um, debt uh, resolution debt and savings, uh, and savings uh, or savings. There's one out there, 70-20-10. Uh, um, I, I found several different models, um, and I'd have to say that I'm a big fan of taking a look at your personal financial situation. Um, if I'm saving, let's say, for retirement, 
Um, my goal will be to put as much towards my retirement as let's say I work for an employer that has a program like a 401k where they're going to give me some free money towards my retirement. And so I would say I'm going to put at least enough um, towards my retirement as it's going to take for me to get the maximum match that my employer is uh, willing to offer me. So that's a strategy that Tom personally employs. And what I advise people I talk about, that should be the minimum amount that you save for retirement. But retirement may not be one of your primary goals. And so, um, you know, only Saray can tell me how much she thinks needs to go into the, was it the Disneyland bucket? Uh, what Disney bucket? Was that what it was, Saray? <laughs> yep, Disneyland. <laughs> okay. So um, if Saray wants to go to Disneyland this year, she's going to need about uh, $20,000 in that bucket, as that one just seems to get be getting more and more expensive. Sounds about right. But um, it's a wonderful question, and I'm afraid that the um, answer to it is a little bit more person-specific to my way of thinking. Um, I love to see some money going towards savings, um, because even if it's 20 bucks a week, um, starting to build an emergency savings can reduce your reliance upon credit cards um, for emergency spending. Um, another stat we don't use in this particular deck, but um, over two thirds of Americans don't have an emergency fund that has a thousand bucks in it. That means that, uh, you know, if there's 10 of us on this call, if there's 20 of us on this call, two thirds of those people, if on the way home from work today, uh, the tire catches a nail and you've got a flat and you've got to replace a tire or more than one, that's going on a credit card because we don't have cash to be able to handle it. That's kind of a, another scary stat. And so I'm a huge fan of having an emergency fund to be able to not have to rely upon credit cards to um, finance those kinds of things. So, uh, but I'm afraid the answer is uh, a little nuanced. I think it really depends on your personal budget and what you said is your primary goals. I love to see people working towards both of those things simultaneously. But how much you should do uh, kind of depends on your deal. But if you just Google it, um, you can find several different models. And one of those might just make sense to you and might say, oh, I really like the way that one um, does it. And so let's talk through that um, as something that would work for you. And that's another place that credit counseling can come into play because that's somebody who might look at your specific scenario and say, look, um, I know you say you want to put 20 percent of your income towards savings. You can't afford to do that. We got to retire some of this debt first. Or some of them might say, you know, that debt, um, here's a great example. I took out an auto loan from Greater Nevada Credit Union about seven years ago, seven and a half years ago. Rates were really amazing at that time. Um, and my car loan was, I, I think it was 3.25% was what my interest rate was on that car loan. Um, today, if I still had that car loan and I hadn't paid it off, I would put more money towards savings as opposed to trying to retire my car loan debt because the, the car loan debt isn't really costing me much. That interest rate is a really good thing, and I can earn 5% in a CD right now or 4% even in a checking account. So for me, the math would work out where I would actually prioritize savings over paying off that car loan today. That's just one example of the nuance of how it really kind of depends on your situation, which of those you should prioritize. But if you're having a tough time making that decision yourself, talk to an expert and help have them help you decide which is right for you. Thanks Absolutely. for bringing that back up, Saray. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Tom. That was amazing information. I do think it comes down to a case by case situation. I didn't see any more questions pop up in this at this moment, um, but I'm going to go ahead and post in the chat right now. I know that many of your questions come after we leave this webinar. Um, and just like I said in the chat that we're all starting on our goals by being here today um, and they're after this webinar ends, we don't have to stop. You can continue to reach out to us for information. Um, I just put some contact information there, as well as I will be sending tools and resources out. Um, but to continue on our education, I would love to tell you about some of those financial education tools that we have been promoting. Um, Tom, I would love, could I have you show us? Oh, awesome. That one. <laughs> So we've come to the end, but like I said, we don't have to stop here. Um, we offer, uh, as in we, Greater Nevada Credit Union, offers many free financial education resources. It really does come down to us taking it into our own control. So if you 
resources that I do want to offer um, after you leave today and you can access these by scanning the QR code on your screen or again I will send them out in a follow-up email. The largest one that I think I have to promote is this free financial coaching. Yes, should I say it again? Free financial coaching. It's through our team balance through GNCU. We pay for this service for our members and community to be able to use and you can do free financial coaching sessions whether it's to build a budget how to build your credit score or today's topic debt management and it is offered in other languages um, one thing that i also want to point out is balance is maybe you're not ready for that coaching session but you're eager for more information balance offers it in the form of podcasts videos articles so for really any type of learner again i will send that um, on the other right hand side of the screen i popped a couple of these into our chat today but these are free modules that only take about five to ten minutes that you can click through right on your phone from anything from again today's topic of debt management to how to teach a grandparent how to bank um, and that information is available to you like i said right at your fingertips for free so i will leave those with you um, and we are past that nine o'clock hour um, and I will go ahead and wrap us up here. Tom, I just have to say a huge thank you and thank you all to those who attended our Greater Financial Wellness webinar series today. Again, for those of you that would like to know more, I will be sending out follow-up information and a survey to see if you've learned a little bit today. If you're interested again in learning more, um, go to gncu.org under the resources tab. You can find all of those financial education resources that we talked about today. Again, reach out to us if you need anything after today. Thank you for helping us, allowing you to help us live greater. Thank you, Tom, uh, and thank you, everybody. Absolutely.